Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at how to construct approximating polynomials to continuous functions. We'll first discuss some error bounds between our polynomials and our functions, and we'll look at how the choice of interpolation points can affect the accuracy. We'll finish by discussing Chebyshev points and Chebyshev interpolation, which can give us good accuracy across a broad range of different functions. So now that we've got a good answer to the discrete interpolation problem, let's look now at a different and actually much deeper question. Can we use interpolation to accurately approximate continuous functions? So suppose we have a continuous function f on the interval from a to b contained within a real line. And one approach we could take here to approximate it would be to sample that function at some interpolation points x0, x1, up to xn, and then use our existing methods to construct a polynomial interpolant and hope that that polynomial interpolant is a good approximation to our function f. So we'd really like our interpolant to be close to f over this whole interval from a to b. And we can actually write down a bound on the difference between our function f and the polynomial interpolant pn of x. And this works out to be f of x minus pn of x is equal to the n plus 1 derivative of f, fn plus 1 of theta divided by n plus 1 factorial multiplied by factors x minus x0, x minus x1 up to x minus xn. And here theta is some value between a and b, excluding the two endpoints. And so we see here that certain features of this formula make intuitive sense. We see here that the right-hand side will actually vanish at the points where x is equal to one of the interpolation points. And that makes sense because our polynomial will go through those interpolation points by construction. So we'll now look at proving this result, and we'll focus on the case of n equal 1 that really contains the crux of the argument. And from there, you should be able to see how to generalize it to higher values of n. So let's now look at proving our interpolation error formula. So this formula tells us that if we have a function f and we have an interpolating polynomial of nth degree pn, then that can be expressed as some value of the n plus 1 derivative of the function f divided by n plus 1 factorial multiplied by this product x minus x0, x minus x1 up to x minus xn of all of the interpolation points. So we're now going to look at proving this for the case of n equal 1. And so what I've drawn here then is a function f that is second differentiable on an interval from a to b and I've let p1 be a linear interpolant based on the interpolation points of x0 and x1. So here between x0 and x1 we can see that we just have a straight line here. So now for some lambda in a, that's a real number we're going to define q to be the linear interpolant p1 plus this quadratic term x minus x0 multiplied by x minus x1 so this quadratic term will vanish at the two endpoints of the interval. So we're now going to fix an arbitrary point, x hat, in the interval from x0 to x1. And we're going to define that q of x hat is equal to f of x hat. So if we think about what our function q will represent in this case, so we've chosen some particular x hat here, and we're now going to choose the quadratic term in our function q in order to match 
the function evaluation at f of x hat. So our function q will look like our line, but with a quadratic correction added in. So now if we think about what lambda would have to be in order to achieve this, then we will have that lambda is equal to f of x hat minus p1 of x hat over x hat minus x0 times x hat minus x1. And this is looking good because if we think about this function, then we have here an expression linking our function f to our polynomial interpolant p1. And so if we could say something about this, that would allow us to maybe come up with our error bound. So our goal here then is to, def is to find what lambda will be. So let's now, let's now define a function e of x, which is equal to f of x minus q of x. And we can now plot what e would look like. And if we look at this points, these points x0, x1, and x hat, then we know that this function e here has to be 0 at each of these three points by construction. So if we draw this function, then it will look something like this. And we therefore know that e has three roots in x0 to x1. So to proceed, we're going to make use of Roller's theorem, which is a result that you can find in real analysis courses. And what Roller's theorem tells us is that if we have a function that is zero at either end of an interval, then there must be a point where, in between where the derivative vanishes. And while this is something that you can prove, it's also something that matches our intuition. And we can see here that for this curve, there will indeed be two points here where the derivative will vanish. So if we were to plot the function e prime, then we would have something that looks like this. And we can now do the same thing again. We can apply Rolle's theorem now to e prime. And again, we could see now that there will be one root for e double prime. So let's define theta in x0, x1 to be this root. So now we can look back at our previous expressions. So we know that 0 is equal to e double prime of theta, 
and that is equal to f double prime of theta minus q double prime of theta. And we can expand this further. That's equal to f double prime of theta minus p1 double prime of theta minus lambda times d squared by d theta squared of theta minus x0 times theta minus x1. And here we have a quadratic, and we can just calculate the derivative of this. The only term that we'll have is coming from the theta squared term, and that will just give us a value of 2. And here we're taking the second derivative of a linear function, so this will vanish. So we'll find then that f double prime of theta minus 2 lambda is equal to 0. And that then tells us that lambda is equal to f double prime of theta divided by 2. And if we now look back at our previous expression, then this tells us that if we rearrange this, we'll end up with that f of x hat minus p1 of x hat is equal to f double prime of theta over 2 times x hat minus x0 x hat minus x1. So in this argument, x hat was arbitrary. And we can choose x hat to be any value between x0 and x1. And we'll end up with the same expression for the difference between f and p1 for some unknown value of theta. And so if we now compare back to our general case, we see that we've proven this for n equal 1. Everything in this formula will match for n equal 1. And we can actually see now how we could generalize the proof that we have here to higher values of n. We can see how we made use of this chain of applying Rolle's theorem. And for higher values of n, we could do a, a larger chain of operations. So using this theorem, let's now look at any x in the interval from a to b. And we can write down an error bound that the difference between f of x and pn of x will be, will be less than or equal to a capital Mn plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial multiplied by the maximum over the interval from a to b of the modulus of the factors x minus x0 multiplied up to x minus xn. And here, in this formula, mn plus 1 is a maximum value of our n plus 1's derivative over the interval from a to b. So we'd now like to really understand how this error will scale as n increases. And so one thing that is nice here is that we have a factor of n plus 1 factorial on the bottom, which will decay as n increases. And what we could hope here is that that would decay fast enough that it would balance out the other two terms of Nm, mn plus 1 and the polynomial expression. But unfortunately, this is not always the case. And a famous pathological example that shows the difficulty of interpolation equally spaced points is called Runge's phenomenon. And so suppose we look at the function f of x, which is equal to 1 over 1 plus 25x squared over the interval from minus 1 to 1. And suppose we now construct polynomial interpolants using equally spaced points over this interval. So if we look at this here, the red curve shows our Runge function and the blue curve show successive polynomial approximations. And we see here that as we increase the degree of polynomial, these oscillations at the end of the interval 
actually increase in magnitude. And this is actually reminiscent of the motivating example that we looked at at the start of this unit. Now, of course, our polynomial Pn matches our function at the evenly spaced sample points exactly. But we really like our polynomial to be a good fit to the function over the entire interval from minus 1 to 1. And so specifically then, we'd like to minimize the maximum of x in minus 1 to 1 of the absolute value of f of x minus pn of x. And this motivates a new definition that we'll see throughout the rest of the course of the infinity norm defined on functions. And specifically in this context, we'll define the infinity norm of f minus pn to be the maximum for x in minus 1 to 1 of the absolute value of f of x minus pn of x. And here, in this context, because our function is defined on the interval from minus 1 to 1, we're making use of our infinity norm defined on the interval as well. But we could equally use the infinity norm definition over any other interval of our choice. So interpolating Runge's function using evenly spaced points actually leads to an exponential increase in the infinity norm error. And we'd really like to be able to create polynomial interpolants of functions that could make that pathological behavior impossible. So let's revisit our error equation. We know here that the difference f of x minus pn of x is equal to fn plus 1 of theta over n plus 1 factorial multiplied by this polynomial expression x minus x0, x minus x1 up to x minus xn. And let's now focus our attention on this polynomial expression x minus x0, x minus x1 up to x minus xn. So intuitively, we could try and choose our interpolation points x0, x1 up to xn to make this polynomial have a small value as possible in this infinity norm bound. So to proceed, we'll make use of a result from approximation theory. So if we look at the interval from minus 1 to 1, then the minimum value of this infinity norm of our expression x minus x0, x minus x1 up to x minus xn, that's equal to 1 over 2 to the n, and it's achieved for the polynomial tn plus 1 divided by 2 to the n. And here, tn plus 1 is the Chebyshev polynomial of the first kind of order n plus 1. And tn plus 1 has a leading coefficient of size 2 to the n. So if we looked at tn plus 1 of x, then it would begin as tn plus 1 equal 2 to the n x to the n plus 1. And so therefore, by dividing out by this factor of 2 to the n, we end up with a polynomial that is monic, meaning that the coefficient of x to the n plus 1 is just 1. And that actually matches then with the scale of the polynomial we're comparing to. We know that the product x minus x0, x minus x1 up to x minus xn, that product will also be monic and will have leading coefficient of 1 on the term of x to the n plus 1. Chebyshev polynomials have this nice property that they equally oscillate over this interval from minus 1 to 1. And I've plotted several of them here. And you can see here that the minima and maxima of these polynomials are achieved at values of minus 1 and 1, respectively. And this equi-oscillation property allows them to keep their infinity norm bound down to the minimum. So Chebyshev polynomials can actually be explicitly defined. And we can define that Tn of x can be given by the cosine of n times the inverse cosine of x. Alternatively, we can define Chebyshev polynomials in terms of recurrence relation. The zeroth Chebyshev polynomial, t0 of x is just equal to 1. The first Chebyshev polynomial, t1 of x is equal to x. And then we can define the rest in terms of recurrence relation 
tn plus 1 of x is equal to 2x times tn of x minus tn minus 1 of x. So if we want to make our polynomial expression x minus x0 up to x minus xn match a Chebyshev polynomial, then all we need to do here is choose our interpolation points to match the roots of the corresponding Chebyshev polynomial. And we could do a small exercise here, and we can show that the roots of Tn are given by xj is equal to cosine of 2j minus 1 pi divided by 2n for j equal 1 to n. So with these properties of Chebyshev polynomials, we can now derive an error bound for the interpolation when we do it using Chebyshev points instead of equally spaced points. And generally speaking, with Chebyshev interpolation, Pn converges to any smooth function f very rapidly. And if we now revisit the Runge function using the Chebyshev points for interpolation, we find that the result is much better. And in fact, in this plot shown here, it's almost indistinguishable from the original function. We see here that the Chebyshev points are actually clustered toward the ends of the interval from minus 1 to 1. And before, when we were using equally spaced points, we saw the tendency of our polynomial interpolants to have oscillations at the end of the interval. And by using these Chebyshev points that are clustered together at the ends, they're actually able to control those oscillations that we had before. So while everything we've spoken about so far has been over this interval from minus 1 to 1, it's easy for us to take any interval from a to b and just linearly rescale from minus 1 to 1 to a to b. So we can use Chebyshev interpolation over any interval that we wish. So the convergence properties actually do depend on the smoothness of f. And you can make precise statements about that, but they're outside the scope of this course. And the smoother the f, typically the faster the convergence. So we're now going to take a look at a code example where we examine the convergence of Chebyshev interpolation to Runge's function, which is a smooth function, and also the absolute value function, f of x is equal to the absolute value of x. And in the plot shown below, I'm showing the convergence of the infinity norm bound compare as a function of the number of interpolation points used. And we see very rapid convergence for Runge's function. For the absolute value function, we still see convergence, although it's much slower. This example program called chinter.py can perform polynomial interpolation of functions based on both linearly spaced interpolation points and Chebyshev interpolation points. So the first thing in the program is the function that we're going to interpolate and we'll look at two different options here. The Runge function which this code is currently set to and the absolute value function which is currently commented out. And we've now got a function called LAGR that can perform Lagrange interpolation and here we take in a number of interpolation points in this xp array and the corresponding function values in the yp array. And it will then return the Lagrange polynomial interpolant at some value x. So we'll now define our control points, our interpolation points. And so we'll use 16 points to begin with and we'll use a linearly spaced grid. And we'll evaluate our function at the corresponding points. And we now want to plot our Lagrange interpolant. And so we'll introduce here a fine sample grid of 500 points between minus 1 and 1. And we'll sample both our Lagrange interpolant and also our function at these points. And we'll then plot the results. So for this example, we see very clear evidence of the Runge phenomenon. And we see that our interpolant has the large peaks at either ends of the interval, just as we would expect. So we'll now switch 
to using Cherishev points instead of the linearly spaced grid. And we'll run this program again. And here we see that we get much better convergence to the function. And those large oscillations that we saw have now disappeared. So with 16 points, we still see some visible differences between our interpolant and our function. And we're now going to increase the number of control points. So if we run this again using 32 points, then now we see that the interpolant is near indistinguishable from our function. So now let's take a quick look at if we do the same thing but with the absolute value function. And we're still going to use 32 points here. And here we'll see that even with 32 points there are some small visible differences. In particular the polynomial has difficulty resolving the loss of differentiability at x equals 0. And if we were to plot interpolants over a range of n, then we see that the convergence properties of the Chebyshev interpolant are better for the Runge function because the Runge function has a higher level of smoothness.